What's happening, YouTube? Happy Monday, and I hope your week is off to a fantastic start once again. My name is Keith McElwain, and welcome back to Monday in the Millions. This week, we're actually giving away a t-shirt. This is actually the shirt right here. Obey the propaganda. Hilarious concept, and actually fits in exactly what this video is about today. First, I'd like to start by thanking everyone for their comments on my last couple of videos. Absolutely entertaining to read some saying I should run for president, and some more modest comments telling me to go suck a but no other comment was more inspiring than this comment that actually said, I hope somebody of real political importance is watching these videos. Which absolutely just fuels my fire, just keeps me going week after week. Now I actually brought along my whiteboard today, my handy dandy whiteboard to help me get across some facts to you that just it's just a little bit tough to do verbally. And so this video today is probably the most important video I've published to date. So if you learned something new in the video today, go ahead and share it with somebody that you feel wants or needs to see this information because I depend on you to get this message out of here. And as always, I'm gonna put the annotations below so if you wanna to jump to a story, go ahead and click that annotation and get started. Otherwise, the next few minutes are gonna completely blow your mind wide open. Now today is Columbus Day, which is actually recognized by less than 47 states inside the United States and has been increasingly known as Indigenous Peoples Day by cities like Dane County in Wisconsin and Berkeley, California. If you fly over the country of Haiti and the island of Hispaniola where Christopher Columbus originally landed, it looks like somebody took a blowtorch and burned away absolutely everything green. And even the ocean around the capital, Port-au-Prince, is contaminated by human sewage and eroded topsoil. And the history of this island is just a small microcosm of what is happening across the world right now. And when Christopher Columbus landed on the island in 1492, virtually the entire island was covered in lush green forests. And according to his crew, the Tieno Indians who lived there lived in what they considered beautiful, perfect lives. But upon the arrival of Christopher Columbus and his crew, they started destroying the natural landscape of the land and started destroying the indigenous population by exporting men as working slaves and exporting women as sex slaves, where girls from nine to 10 years old were in highest demand. And so what I did was I took the written accounts from Columbus's crew and actually made a little chart right here and took the major dates and years. By 1492, there was 1.5 million people as a part of the population. In 1516, it was reduced to 12,000. And in 1542, only less than 30 years later, it was reduced to 200 people. And in 1555, less than 64 years after Columbus landed, the indigenous population was destroyed. So the big takeaway here, more importantly than Christopher Columbus being the first of the European settlers to come to the Americas, this is the first time that business and profit was put in front of, and more important than human lives here in the Americas. Which brings us to our next point, the future of the United States of America and what we really need to be looking at when choosing a presidential candidate and a real game plan for the next four years. And as we see with Columbus, there's a reoccurring theme through history that has us putting our goals of financial gain and business before the lives and the health of our population. So the real question becomes, can we increase business? Can we create new revenue to balance the biggest debt that our global economy has ever seen, while also enhancing the standard of living of our population? In other words, can we have our cake and eat it too? So first, let's take a look at the economic population and see how the cash flows from hands to hands. Romney came out a few weeks ago and said, 47% of the United States is on welfare. Just less than a half of the United States on assistance which means that they do not pay any taxes and that they are receiving money from the government in the form of assistance. And the next stat we have, according to Wikipedia, is that 3.65% of the United States is making more than $200,000 a year. I just rounded up to 4% for us. And we also have the stat that the top 1% of the United States is making more than $960,000 a year on average. And we're gonna go ahead and put that at a million. 3% we consider the small business owners that are making more than $200,000 a year and less than $1 million, which leaves 49% of our population left in our working middle class. So 49% of the United States is making less than $200,000 a year and also paying taxes. So you can now say that the assistance is 47% of the United States and they're not paying taxes, they don't have enough money to do that. 49% of the United States is considered the working middle class where they're making less than $200,000 a year and paying between 10 and 15% on average taxes. Then we have 3%, which is the small businesses, 
they're making between $200,000 and $1 million, and they're getting taxed at 35%. And then we have the top 1% that's considered the rich that's making more than $1 million a year, also supposed to be taxed at 35%. And so what we have to understand is that these numbers only relate to annual income, what somebody makes on a yearly basis. This does not apply to the money that's already in the bank account. You cannot tax what's already in the bank account that's been taxed years ago. So the next question becomes, how much of the wealth of the world is in bank accounts right now that cannot be taxed to help the debt of the government? And so if we look at the top 1%, we see that the top 1% of the United States owns 90% of the wealth. And these dollars can't be touched. They've already been taxed. So for example, if we look at somebody like John Hammergren, of McKesson Pharmaceuticals. He makes $131 million a year as the highest paid CEO in the United States. That is only 0.1% of his net worth, which is $142 billion. So we can't tax the $142 billion. That's already been taxed years ago. It's in his bank account already. We can only tax the $131 million. And if we go ahead and look at the Forbes 400, the top 400 richest people in the world, we're looking at the point zero 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 one percent of the world's population that owns 50% of the wealth. Again, this is 400 people that have 50% of the wealth in their bank account. It cannot be taxed. And if we take a look at three of my favorite billionaire executives, Larry Page of Google, Meg Whitman of Hewlett Packard, and John Mackey of Whole Foods, They've all made billions of dollars enhancing the lives of millions of people across the world. They've paid taxes on it and it sits in their bank account right now, rightfully so. And they've all opted to only receive $1 per year in salary. How is taxing that $1 going to bring any type of money or any type of benefit to the government? How does raising taxes on someone like that make sense? How is that going to help the government balance their budget? And lastly, according to the Huffington Post, nearly 300 of the top corporations in the 0.000001% of the United States is paying an average of 18.5% in average taxes, which is half of the legal tax rate they need to be paying, which puts the full financial burden on the small business and middle class that pay top dollar taxes into the government that gets paid back out to the half of the United States that needs assistance to live. And according to the Small Business Association, small businesses provide 50% of the jobs to the private sector in the middle class. If we put the financial stress on the small businesses and they feel they have to lay off or fire people from the middle class, they're going to shrink the middle class from 49% even smaller and we're going to see these people fall into the group that needs to ask for assistance and unemployment to survive. How is the United States going to sustain itself if this happens? And we're not going to ask the rich to empty their bank accounts, but we're going to ask the rich for some of their strategies to help us create the revenue that they've been able to tap into. And the answer is passive income technology. Go ahead and click the annotation real quick if you want to see my video from a few weeks ago that goes into how passive income technology has been shaping the Forbes 400 and showing how wealth is being developed in a brand new way by people like Bill Gates and people like Elon Musk, the founder of PayPal, who's gone on to start three other passive income technology companies in the last few years. And how epic companies like Google and Apple would not dare be left out of this green gold rush. And even President Obama had the right idea when he got into the presidency four years ago and spent $90 billion on passive income technology companies such as solar, and wind, and electric car type of companies. The only problem was that when he spent this money, he didn't get any product. He didn't get any assets that would be able to generate revenue for the United States government. Go ahead and click the annotation if you want to see the video I made a few weeks ago that goes into more of the details surrounding that. But otherwise, we can look at the $90 billion investment that Barack Obama made. And if we look at it in an alternate universe, as if that $90 billion that was spent on passive income technology out of the stimulus plan actually purchased product and had assets for the government, we would see a return on our investment in three years. That's the standard type of return. If you ask any business person when they make an investment into a project, especially something like a passive income technology company, you want to see a return on your investment in three years, and there's plenty of technology out there that you could do it in. So if you saw a $90 billion return on your investment in three years, what that would actually mean 
is that you're making $82 million per day. And you can imagine if President Obama was getting this kind of ROI, nobody would be questioning his presidency right now. But even so, it's never too late to start. So right now, the United States debt is increasing by $4.1 billion per day. That's also $4,100 million per day. So even if we had this first move, which was $82 million per day gaining, we would still be far off of paying this debt off. So the question is, how many years would we have to do this? And if we look at a $90 billion investment breaking even in three years, we can consider that as one unit. That's one unit of investment. And what we can do is just scale it out. So President Obama said, well, let's double down on green energy. Well, let's do it. So we double down and we take the $90 billion that we made back in the first three years and we spend that $90 billion on new green energy. And what we'll do is we'll spend another 90 billion because we see it's working. We're getting a return on our investment. We're reducing the debt. Let's double down. So what we see here is that by doing that, we have the original unit that's not going anywhere. So when we spend another $180 billion on this technology, now we're going to have an additional 90 times two. We're going to have three units of passive income technology and having three units of that times the $82 million per day. Now we're looking at $246 million per day. Look at that, in six years, in less than two terms as a president, you would be able to reverse the debt by $246 million per day. We're getting closer to knocking this number off. And what we'll do is we'll just jump down. If we go from 180 and we double down again, we go to 360, we go to 720, and in year 15, we're $1,400 billion in. Year 18, we're looking at $2,880 billion of investment. And what we're going to see is that the numbers keep growing. So the $246 million per day that would be in year six, we would see that more than double by year nine. And we would be looking at $574 million in money coming into the United States government. We would be making $574 million a day. Then year 15, we're looking at $2,542 million a day, which is $2.5 billion. Now we're halfway there. Year 18, we're looking at $5,166 million per day, $5.1 billion, we've beat the debt. The debt is $4.1 billion a day right now, and it would take less than 20 years of doubling down on passive income technology to be able to generate enough income on a daily basis to be able to offset $4.1 billion of growing debt per day. This passive income technology would be able to reverse the growing debt that we've been accruing over the last 72 years since 1940. So the question becomes, if President Obama doesn't have the business savvy to make this type of investment to get this back, then we'll Mitt Romney. And if we look at his track record, he has an impeccable business record. His company created the office supply company Staples and made it what it is today as the number one office supply company in the world. And he also took Domino's Pizza Delivery Service to be number one in the United States with over 9,500 locations across the US. Everything he touches, he gets a return on investment. But the question becomes, who is investing in Mitt Romney? Who's investing in his presidential campaign? And if we look at the numbers and look at his agenda, we see that $36 million was invested into his campaign by the oil and coal companies. And this is his agenda. He wants to deregulate the coal companies and the oil companies, and he wants to focus on that being the energy. And by repealing this legislation that protects the people that are working in the coal mines and working in these factories, we would see tens of thousands of premature deaths. We would see thousands of unnecessary heart attacks and hundreds of thousands of childhood asthma cases. So where Obama has the right agenda and the wrong strategy, Mitt Romney has the right strategy and the wrong agenda. So if a presidential candidate can't do it with these types of numbers, it's going to be up to you and I to make our own investments to make this happen on the individual level. We can make this happen in the private sector. We can bring this technology to the middle class. We can bring this technology even to the assisted class to benefit them as well. We can take these strategies that the 1% have embracing and thriving with and really enhance our lives and take this world to a whole new place. And that's all for the show. If you like the show, click the like below to let me know and make sure to subscribe Subscribe to be back for next week of Monday in the Millions. My name is Keith McElwain, and I'll see you next week.